folks, welcome inside the Paris Sea Palace High above 2919 East Broadway. This is the Jake Feinberg Show coming to you live on Power Talk. Please go to our website, powertalk.live. Download our free app and stream all of our live local programming, including Solomon on Blast, the Jim Parisi Show, and yours truly, the Jake Feinberg Show. We can't thank you enough for making us part of your day today. And uh, what a treat we are in for today. We are, we are joined by one of the greatest melodic improvisers on the guitar of all time. He's somebody who's laid below the surface, uh, I think maybe intentionally, just being a modest cat. But he is a blazing inferno of energy and light and sound when he gets on stage or in the studio. A high honor, Jack Wilkins. Welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. That's quite a compliment. <laughs> I got to tell you, man, I mean, I've been waiting to, I mean, I, you know, it's, we came, I don't know if you recognize that track there, did you? No, sure. Barry Miles record, yeah. yeah. Hi, Jack. Hi, you got it, baby. I mean, I, I mean, Barry, I, I, here's the bottom line. I, I've interviewed, you are now, you joined the compendium of Abercrombie and Frizzell and, and, uh, and, Oh my God, I'm blanking out. But I mean, Leo Nocentelli and and uh, uh, you know just d- hundreds of amazingly gifted guitar players. But uh, I wanted to ask you truthfully if you could talk about where you learned on the bandstand, where you learned to develop your rhythm chops. Because if you don't, if you didn't have rhythm back uh, even now, if you don't have rhythm, you're not going to get a gig. And I wanted to know how you uh, how you developed your rhythm. That's what they say. They don't mean a thing, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> you got this. <laughs> uh, well, rhythm is, uh, uh, you know, I don't know exactly how how to tell somebody else how to do it, but I know what I did. I mean, I, I grew up playing rock and roll and blues. You probably wouldn't recognize that in my playing, but it's it's there for sure. I mean, I played a lot of blues when I, and, and rock when I was a kid. Uh, from doo-wop things to... Uh, Chuck Berry sort of stuff, you know, blues and, and I, you know, I was in the bands, lots of band, different bands. So if you don't keep up with them, you're not going to get close to do any more gigs. And that's what I wanted to do more than anything. Make sure I keep playing, you know. Well, uh, can you? I mean, were you with? So the, I worked on my. Yeah. Go ahead. I, well, were, well, I mean, were, go ahead. Were, were, were you were, were you a city? Were you born in New York? Where were you born? Well, yeah, well, Brooklyn, essentially. All right, so I mean, like, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, like, because everybody, I mean, the the Apollo was thriving. They had gospel Sundays. Where, I mean, these rhythm and blues bands. This was, uh, this was like the um, Little Richard kind of Chuck Berry, uh, or was it more like, uh, you know? Yeah, it's sort of yeah, we like that. It was pretty much like that. A lot of them, a lot of bands I played with were like that. There's so many of them, I can't remember half of them. Hey, Jackson was one I played with. Uh, gosh, the list goes on and on and on. So, so many. Bruce Townsend, do you know his name? I don't I know. I played with his, 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 his trio, and um, we played uh, a place called Edgemont Casino for years. And that, that hones your craft, too, you know, because you're playing with all kinds of different people, different singers, different musicians sitting in. And, um, and, and then, I, you know, I learned how to, I've owned my craft playing with people like that, people that I knew uh, knew were great players. I mean, I didn't consciously know I was doing that, you know. It wasn't something I said, oh, I'm learning how to play good rhythm. <laughs> it wasn't like that at all. It was just I'm keeping up with the, what's happening up there in the bandstand, you know. I, I mean, maybe, so the, maybe, like maybe the, 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 the question is, um, you know, how your where your ears grew the most. I'm trying to get this idea. I mean, you guys were not academically trained musicians obviously you know no that's that's not true i studied i was a very studied player musician i took lessons on all kinds of different instruments also not to mention the harmony theory and well no no no. uh, i I mean but uh, i want to be clear i want to be clear uh you weren't the vocabulary of music from your time was was not growing in academia i don't i don't believe uh, vocabulary music can grow in academia i mean you might have been schooled but you were on the bandstand yeah. three, four sets a night, five, six days a week. So that's where you learned how to play. Let's be very clear about that. Of course, yeah, that's 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 right. That was that was my school. That was my education. Not not going to school, but that was what it was like. That and those days. they didn't have guitars in uh, school, jazz schools. That there weren't many jazz guitar players. Now, uh, then in those days, uh, Berkeley was about the only one. I actually went up there to check it out and 
didn't care for it much, you know. Why didn't you? What, what was? Because I mean, I there was it was just one brownstone. What what was not appealing to you? Oh well, it wasn't that it wasn't appealing. It, it, it was appealing, especially Jack Peterson was teaching at the time, who I had great admiration and respect for, still do, uh, always have. Uh, he, he's a dear friend of mine now. But then, so I played with him, and uh, I said, "Oh, this guy's great." But the cost of going up there and studying was ten times what I would have learned right here in New York. I didn't need to go up there to learn, and that's all I was concerned about was learning, not getting a degree. Essentially, that. That wasn't something that was on my mind. I wasn't thinking about that. Well, I just, all I, you have to understand, all I wanted to do was play. I mean, I didn't think about too much about the future. <laughs> well, at the, the time also, I mean, they, they weren't, uh, it was not an accredited school, and so they had to start t- giving classes like French in order to, uh, to actually get a degree. But, I mean, can you talk about... Is that so? Is that, is that so? I didn't know that. Yeah, well, I, I no, thought I th- it was. Yeah, it was. well, I, just inter- I was just transcribing my interview with Abercrombie, and he said that, you know, they were... Berkeley was not an accredited school, so you could get a diploma, but you couldn't get a degree. So they had to start off oh. offering other classes. But, uh, you know, this is a very important situation because uh, I'm, I wanted you to talk about, uh, ultimately, until roughly the 70s, late 70s, jazz, whatever you think of that word, the, the jazz culture was a subculture. It was essentially a black yeah. music culture. And I want to know how you got sucked into that and ultimately – in the late 50s, uh, you know, what you were getting off on insofar as the music was was it was changing, it was becoming psychedelic. It was psychedelic jazz. And that was being, yeah. being led by Rasan, and it was being led by Ornette, it was being led by Dizzy. And I want to, because mm-hmm. you already had the, the, the blues rock stuff, and I can hear that in your playing, but it was getting more psychedelic. And I want, I want to know about where Jack Wilkins fit into that whole paradigm. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, I, you know, I dabbled in it. I mean, uh, that's uh, I, that sounds dismissive to say I dabbled in it. I, I'm not dismissing it at <laughs> no, all. No, no, no. Uh, uh, but uh, you know, uh, you dabbled in it. What does that mean? You know, it, it could sound just condescending. Uh, no, I, I was, I got into playing with fusion bands. I played with Elephants. Memory, remember them? Oh my God! A bunch of uh, dreams. I had played with that band for a while, uh, and. Um, a couple other things that I could have done, which I decided not to do. It really wasn't my cup of tea. Uh, as much as I liked it, I didn't want to spend all that time playing solid body with, with effect pedals, and the pedals were just coming out at the time, you know. So there, there was a lot of that want, to, that, you know, face shifters and distortion boxes, whatnot. They were big old boxes. They were funny looking items, you know. Uh, I I kept them for years and years in my closet upstairs, and uh, it was quite a sight to see those things. To you know, for thirty, forty years later, <laughs> now that they have all these pedals in like tiny little p- tiny pedals, but before that, they were big. They were big monster things, you know. Uh, so you know, I didn't really. Uh, I as much as I liked it. Um, I still was drawn to to the guesses straight ahead. You know, I was still drawn to Bill Evans and. Well, no, this is. I want this uh, is important know. because because actually I didn't. I it was more my not not being dismissive, but I'm, I want you to go back before Dreams, before Elephant's Memory. That this this yeah. this this, early, this six this is very important. This early '60s period of jazz with. With uh, you know sixty one sixty two, you had I mean when I interviewed Miroslav Vichus, he said that that was the first time in sixty one where he heard Scotty Lafaro, Lafaro using yeah. the, the bass as a voice instrument and not just as a timekeeper. And I want that that's the that's the bag of Wilkins, not the electric wah pedal stuff. I get that, but I'm talking about that yeah. early sixties. You know, because you had Bertoncini over at the uh, at the Playboy Club with Dick Burke and Larry Willis. I mean, I know Wilkins was doing. You were marinating in this scene. I want to know where you were at, and also if you could talk about how the music was changing because there was the modal jazz and then all this other stuff going on. So you can riff on that. Yeah, sure. Uh, the the uh, well, I was a bit young at, at the time. You know, I, in the early '60s, I was still in my <laughs> teens. You know, but uh, I was um, I was actually blown away by Scott Lafaro's playing as well. Probably just like Miroslav, even though I wasn't a bass player. I mean, I I was more influenced by other instruments than the guitar. But however, having said that, uh, 
there was um, a lot of fusion things happening, like with Larry Coriel and and John was doing some of that too. Mike, John Abercrombie, you know, uh, what and even Pat Martinez sort of got. Well, Pat was more of a straight ahead player, so I was influenced by that too. I mean, let's put it this way. There was so much music happening in those days. I mean, you could simmer with anything. I mean, you know, you could you have a potpourri of music to deal with. You could go from one club to the next and hear some fusion. You could hear some bossa nova. You can hear some straight ahead. You can hear Amon Jamal. You can hear Bill Evans. You can hear uh, Freddie Hubbard. You could hear, you know what I mean? Mind-blowing. music was just... Unbelievable. Yeah, it was mind It wasn't even thought of at the time. I mean, I never thought that, wow, this is a great time. I was just enjoying what it was, you know. Uh, I went to hear everybody. I was I was out five, four, five nights a week. It wasn't that expensive either, so you could do that. You know, today you you know you got to you know take out a loan to go hear somebody at Birdland. You know, so it's it's kind of crazy, and the music is getting lost between uh, with all that. But in those days, it was really actually quite easy to hear a lot of great music. They had clubs all over the place, and I used to I used to play at a bunch of them. I said that bunch of places on the Lower East Side had all these funky little bars and bandstands and we'd laugh but you want to talk about learning how to play I mean I played a lot with Sonny Fortune up there and um, this is phenomenal you were, were, you, were you down at down at Slugs and places like that yeah I played at Slugs I, I played mean, at um, yeah. yeah I played uh, the, that uh, Tin Palace remember that or was it the Tin well, Palace I mean I was, born, I was yeah. born in 78 but I do have vinyl records from uh like you know, but 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 uh, you know, this is this period of time. I mean, were you? I mean, I interviewed Sonny Fortune. He was talking about uh, playing with Rashid Ali in, in a duo setting, just sort of where they would just they lost track. Yeah. They lost track of TikTok time. Um, oh, and, that's wonderful! I must have been special to that. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big Sonny fan. I mean, I'm and, a big fan of Sonny's. How did you? So, yeah. I mean, can you talk about that? that just talk about playing with Sonny, and then ultimately how it helped your ears grow, and and uh, sonically how the music the music was a street music. I mean, it was the culture yeah. was in the street, and that's part of the issue now with the gentrification and the stifling of culture. I mean, this is part mm-hmm. of the issue. You talk about taking out a loan to go to Birdland or whatever, you know, to go to uh, Smoke or you know, I mean, we we kind of joke about this stuff, but it's not cheap. Uh, but there before it was, yes, you saw the, the the darker underbelly of 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 society because there were brilliant genius cats who were homeless, you know, and people like that. But I mean, the accessibility to authentic melodic improvisation was everywhere, and I cannot. It was everywhere, yeah. And I just, yeah. I mean, can you talk about one of these Lower East Side gigs that you had and who you played with, and ultimately, you know, how your ears grew? Um, well, frankly speaking, I did so many gigs down there. I don't remember half of them at this point, which is very strange because I usually remember every gig that I've ever done. But in those days, like 63, 64, I was pretty young. I was, I was still in my teens. So I wasn't, I mean, uh, wasn't even allowed to drink, you know, couldn't drive a car. I couldn't vote, you know, that, but I was out there listening to jazz and playing it, playing it. And, um, you have to remember, I you know I grew up with this big old arch top guitar, right? So uh, a lot of gigs um, I didn't really want to do because there was it was so loud. Music was sudden, suddenly, uh, almost overnight, became super loud. Um, with with Tony Wynn's Lifetime, for example, uh, a few years after that, and. Uh, the, well, the, yeah, I don't want. I don't. Good, right? I, I don't want to move out of the early '60s. This, and we're not even in the Beatles yet. I don't want to move out of this period. Okay. The, the, the music, okay. I do not. Yeah. I the, once we we'll get there, but this is where. Yeah, this okay. is, I mean, I even. I, I'm sure it's hard for you to remember because it's pre '65. It's pre rock. Yeah, sure, you know, sure. Okay, but but I mean, this is where. I mean, it, it, I guess what I'm saying is I've interviewed all the cats and all that did all the jug band music, Jim Queskin's jug band, David Grisman. They they talked about the early 60s being essentially a very vapid, empty time in rock because Elvis went to the army, Little Richard found God, um, and then all of a sudden it was like this very sterile time, but not in jazz. jazz no, not in jazz. Fire. You're quite right. Mm-hmm. Jazz was on fire. Yeah, it was on fire. And, and so yeah. just, you know, if you can talk to the audience about just your, I mean, even if you can't, 
whatever comes to your mind. I, you don't need to go through any yeah. sort of chronological thing, but this is pre-Beatles jazz. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, there, well, there was a lot of schools, actually, out there at the time, and that's what made it so fascinating and, and, and diverse. I mean, there were, there were guys that were um, uh, playing I mean, sort of out shit, you know, if you want. Oh, I can't say that word, I suppose. That's all right. Uh, playing out music and... Um, uh, I guess you might consider Roland Kirk being one of them, but I never thought that particularly, you know, or Cecil Taylor, for example, those guys, uh, they might be considered out players, but I never thought of them like that. However, that's not neither here nor there. But uh, the, there was a lot of different ways of going, and, there was, and then there was the other side of it where a lot of people were playing standard tunes with bossa nova feels, you know, the bossa nova had suddenly taken over a bit, you know, and uh, the Jobim's music started to become part of a very important part of, of American culture as well. Uh, and people played a lot of the bossa nova took over. It was maybe a few years after that with Stan Getz and all that. That's the, right. Uh, Stude, the Belt, Gilberto and Joao and all that. That was in Charlie Bird, <laughs> which, which, is, which is another one of my guys I like very much. Anyway, to go on and on about that, there was a lot of different schools of thought, and I dabbled in all of it because I was fascinated with all kinds of music. I wasn't a, uh, uh, a what do you call it, um, you purist. Yeah, you, you weren't. Yeah, you weren't. Yeah, you weren't and I love it. You weren't locked into one style or one genre. No. Yeah. No, I wasn't. I was not involved in one style or the other. I, I, I embraced everything. I was curious about all kinds of music, and I went to hear all kinds of music at different places. You know, it's a places downtown usually had the more avant-garde, if you will, out stuff. Uh, um, Tim Palace had a lot of odd music, you know. And then there was, of course, the the big bands that, that had um, a lot of strange, like Don Ellis' band. Do you know his name, Don Ellis? Of course. Well, he, uh, you see, Don, Don, yeah. Don Menza played with Ellis when he was playing Straight Ahead. And then he came back from the yes, army, and, and and Ellis was playing, you know, thirteen over seven, you know, and it was driving men insane. I know, I, I know. I played with that band up in Buffalo a couple of weeks. <laughs> 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 I went up to Buffalo quite a lot at that time. Buffalo and Syracuse, a friend of mine. Uh, later on, I went up there with somebody else, Don, uh, Bob Rosen, uh, uh, Rosenblum. But the uh, so what I was um, playing a lot of that, and I, you know, what set me apart a little bit was I could read me I could read pretty well I studied I was a studying musician I studied the guitar I really did you know I wanted to know how to do everything I was interested in music, Julian Bream and uh, John Williams and uh, and Larry Coriel's fusion approach and John McLaughlin's wild technique and Johnny Smith's beautiful melodies and uh, Jim Hall's sense of subtlety and you know, Kim Wes's drive and Kenny Burrell's whatnot. You know, George Benson was out then at the time. He was, was tearing it up himself. Wow. I mean, hearing George live in his day was a sight to behold. What's funny <laughs> is I, I, I interviewed, excuse me, I interviewed Benson uh, in January, and he said that um, in 65 or so, he actually turned mm -hmm. he turned down James Brown's offer to be to be the opening act for him, and he was more of a singer than a player. But I mean, if anything, uh, I mean, this is to me like one of the most. It was just did did you actually uh, have any gigs as a leader? Maybe not on record, but were you leading a band in the early sixties? Yes, I was. I, I had a little band, uh, and we played at the Lower East Side, and uh, to be honest with you, I think, but can't remember the name of the place right now, Vivery Lounge, that's right, it was called the Vivery Lounge. How do you spell that? It was on Vivery, V-I-V-E-R-I-E, -E, Vivery, something like Who that. Was Who was in the trio? Who was in the trio? Well, the, it was a quartet with piano and myself, and I played vibes in that band. Oh my, you uh, played also. vibes in that band? Yeah. Oh, now, yeah, now, now we're getting somewhere, vibes. now we're getting somewhere. So yeah, you, yeah, I got I got enamored with uh, Milt Jackson and Red Norvo and uh, and, uh, and and mostly Cal Jada. Actually, I was really I just got so into Cal Jada and his Latin his Latin bands and wow. In fact, I had a lot of a lot of guys in my neighborhood that were uh, Cubans and we used to get together and jam all the time. That maybe that's part of the rhythm thing you're talking about. I mean, I know how to I know how to play those rhythms. 
Well, you got to you got to learn how you learned the you learned maybe you didn't know it, but you were learning the clave beat at that time. I was. I was learning. I was learning it without knowing I was learning it. Yeah, right. That, that's, the, that's the best way to do it. I mean, that's, <laughs> the best way to yeah, do it. I mean, I didn't say, "Hey, look what I learned here today." Right. It wasn't like that. Right. It was, it was like I was just again, like I said before, I was just keeping up with the stuff that was going on, you know. And uh, but uh, that band had uh, my cousin, my cousin on bass, who wasn't very good, and a friend of mine, Billy Fagan, who played drums, and uh, none other than Barry Manilow on piano. What? Yeah, Barry Manilow. On Barry piano, yeah. Manilow on piano. Yeah, he was the piano player. Oh, in this the band, is yeah. legendary stuff. I, I mean, so uh, I mean, I didn't know he he was. <laughs> that is, I can't even go. I, I'm I'm a little bit stunned. Were you playing like? Uh, because if I remember correctly, that was like the Jader Jader's band was more like Benny Velarde in the late in the early '60s and the uh, Willie mm. Willie Bobo Mongo. But were you playing? Yeah. Like, were you playing Latin? Yeah. Were you playing Latin jazz and yeah, we played yeah, we were playing a lot of that. But we also played standard tunes, you know. And uh, um, I played only vibes in that band. It's very funny. Uh, That's aw- got, Do you have any tapes of that be- stuff? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, I think there is one tape of a, it's a reel to reel I have that's hidden away somewhere in my closet. But I'd like to try to get that. We out might need. We might need, to, we might need to excavate that. That's so. I mean, did you? Yeah. Th- this is Ma- Ma- did Manilow uh, had a jazz bag. I mean, I didn't know he had that deep a bag of playing. Oh yeah. Oh. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, he was. He was a big fan of Oscar Peterson's and. Uh, he, he didn't. He try to play like that. He so who could, right? Right. So, but he sh- he sure admired it, and he he was a big fan of Barney Kessel too, the guitar player. He loved Barney Kessel. So, but between those two guys, and he lived in my neighborhood. I saw him all the time, and I said, "Let's play sometime." We played, and we worked it. Well, it worked out good. And he knew a lot of um, he knew a lot of tunes, and he he was it was pretty good. He was a pretty good player. In fact, he was a very good player. Um, he was no Oscar Peterson, but like, like I said, who is? So, but uh, he was good enough to, well, we were good enough to get gigs together. It was all right. <laughs> I want to There's ask, some photos on my, I mean, this there's is, some photos on my website of that, yeah. Talking to Jack Wilkins here live on Power Talk, having a ball. I, you know, I, I uh, can you talk about uh, McLaughlin's unorthodox style? I, I can't, I'm not really, I'm, I'm a, I, I can keep time on a modified trap, trap set in a, in a kind of a blues rock setting, but I'm not a musician. Uh, mm. What? Uh, what was when? Do you remember like when you saw him live, or what was unorthodox about his style? Uh, his time feel was different from what I ever heard before. Uh, not ever heard, but it 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 was somewhat baffling. His phrasing was was left-handed for me. Uh, instead of putting the beat on one, he would always put it on one and a half or four and four and a half or something. His his his. Uh, his time feel was very unusual to me. I'm not judging it and saying it's bad or good. No. I'm just saying it was it was different, and uh, you know I was fascinated with it in a way. You know, you know, us play plays like that a little bit uh, is is um, um, uh, what's his face? You know, the guy that plays with La- with um, um, with John used to play with him quite a lot. Uh, uh, shoot, well, Demiola or uh... Uh, Al, Al Demiola? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, he's also he he also has that same. Um, uh, off, off time feel. It's, it's uh, for me. It is. You know, you have to understand. Everything I say is how I feel about it. Doesn't mean it's a fact. That's why I had. You know, no, but I want you to be clear. You guys are so modest. I don't invite you on so that you can like make proclamations that are officially one hundred percent correct. I just want your. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's my that's my take on it, and um, you know, and, uh, and I've transcribed some McLaughlin and uh, and some Al Demio just to know what it was. It, uh, mind you, it was never been my favorite kind of playing because, like I said, it was it was too jagged for me. It didn't swing hard enough. Although I must say, his time was impeccable, especially uh, both of those guys have time that's absurdly great. <laughs> However, like I say, the beat falls in the weirdest places, so <laughs> that's why it's not. Cons- it doesn't. A lot of jazz musicians can't listen to that because they say, "Man, this is weird. What is it that I don't like about it?" And I can tell you what they don't like about it. It's not, it's not on the beat. It doesn't, it doesn't connect with the tune. And if they're ba- especially playing standard tunes, <laughs> that's right. You know, when when they play standard tunes, wow, forget about it. That is just so not cool. I don't like it at all. 
um, I feel a little bit about Jarrett the same way. You know, as much as as, as genius as he is, and I fully agree that he is, um, his standard platoon playing is another thing that's just a bit off. Pat Metheny, too, for that matter. The, I think that their, their time feel is is a little skewed for me, for my taste. And then, but, you know, that's the way the new world is in a lot of ways. Not the new world, but that sort of thinking about music. It, it, it just, if that makes any sense. No, I, I mean, you're, you're, I, I think that, I, I listen, I've, I've talked to Larry Taylor from uh, Canned Heat, the bass player, and he says that... Mm. Uh, so many, uh, you know, he started on upright, but th- just this, the 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 homage and the respect is not being paid to the blues the way it should be. The simplest stuff seems to be the stuff that yeah. is, is ignored. That we've intellectualized mm. the music to a point where, well, Ramsey Lewis said. I mean, people began to stop being able to tap their foot to it. Alan Schwartzberg said the same thing. I mean, it's like you know, pretty soon it became uh, music for musicians. You know. And yeah, that, it, yeah. you know, and it became too much of a head game. And so, you know, you, you, you'd play so, uh, some standard like, uh, you know, uh, you the night and the music or all the things you are. And the next thing you know, the solo has no connection to the actual tune. People lose that stuff. That's what that's that, that's what I think is ha- does happen quite often. It's it's and it's 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 more and more like that. I have students that uh, have no idea about a climax of a tune. They don't know what the tune is. They don't know where the the emotional sections are i mean and tunes are actually built in with that i was lucky you know because i mentioned i had this cousin that played bass in that band by the way the name of that band was called the jazz partners <laughs> wait, 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 the one with manilo <laughs> yeah oh i jazz love it. Wait, this is so so th- this is really one of the most epic bands of all time I've, i mean this is this is why i do my show so continue you know, Barry, I went to see him over at Radio City Music Hall about, oh, 15 years ago, and uh, I hadn't seen him for a long time. And it was really nice to see him. He's a good cat. But Larry, uh, Barry is just, what you see is what you get. That's exactly who he is. He's a genuinely nice fella. Um, and uh, his, um, I brought some pictures of the band to him, and he was so thrilled. He said, wow, he said, I forgot about, almost forgot about this. And he called over his entire crew and the band. Say, hey, look, this is a picture of my me and my first band. <laughs> the Jazz Partners, unbelievable. Yeah, it's a pic. He mentions me in his book actually um, about that. Um, also, um, it's on my website if you want to see a picture of it. Absolutely. Yeah. It's toward, yeah, towards the back of the, of the photo. But I mean, let's. So, but, you know, you, yeah, go ahead. You, you, you mentioned Matt, uh, Ramsey Lewis. My, I was lucky because, like I said, I had this cousin that played bass in that band. He. Um, he used to tell. I was too very. I was very young, eighteen, nine, seventeen. But he took me to the old Birdland, the the real one, the first one. Sure. Uh, on Fifty Second Street, you know, and oh uh, man, I got to see John Coltrane's band uh, in 1963. Uh, I saw uh, J and K. I saw Miles. I saw Bud, Bud Powell. Believe it or not, uh, he had just come back from. I guess he was in Paris, France, or something, and uh, he came in to play. He, w- he wasn't very good because he was very sick. But Ramsey Lewis, I don't remember now who he opened for. Maybe J and K, J J Johnson and K Winding. Sure, that was a pretty big. Band. You remember them? That was a very big band for a while. And uh, Ramsey Lewis, man, he just tore it up. It was so much fun to hear him play. I had no idea how great he was I until know. I saw him live that time. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That 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 was you know as used to say in those days was mind bending. You know? <laughs> Dude, I'm still I, you know this is but this is the thing I mean you know uh, uh, Jack Wilkins being incredibly humble. I, everybody has their own time feel. I mean even now I'm gonna go play with these guys today and I'm driving them crazy. I'm driving the the rhythm guitar player crazy because I'm playing I'm playing good time. My tempo's good. But the way I hear and feel the music is on the one and three. Now, I know that ultimately, yeah. you know, in a professional setting, I'd need to figure out how to correct that if I was going to play on the two and four. But I really I want this to be, this is very important for the record. Um, uh, Demiola told me he was like 13 years old. His dad brought him into the, the bitter end or something. And uh, and uh, Barry Miles was there and Terry Silverlight and Eric Kloss, people like that. And uh and Demiola made the case that that uh, that Barry Miles was the first fusion musician. He was the first. Uh-huh. And, yeah. And and I want you to talk about because when I listen to 
that album. That's when you first came on my yeah. ra- my radar, and your playing is it's odd metered. That's just right in Barry's wheelhouse, and you didn't seem like you were feeling. It didn't. You didn't. I mean, it, you were on fire. So I mean, was he the first fusion cat? Is that fair to say? And then how did you get? Um, yeah, he was the first fusion cat that that I did anything significant with for sure. And uh, but there was a guy before that, and to be honest with you, I can't remember his name. Don't say but that. He, don't say that. You can't no, just throw that out. I don't remember his name. But let me tell you the story about him. This Go ahead. guy. Yeah. It, uh, he he devised uh, um, an organ. A synth- synthesized organ, right? Where you know synthesizers for for the most part for a long, long time could only have play one note. Did you know that, right? Only one note. He devised an organ that c- could play as many notes as you want. Dig that. This is like sixty two, sixty three, and uh, whoa. and and. But you want you want to hear the name of his band? Yeah. He had a band, and it was called Star Wars. <laughs> oh my god this is, wait, is it uh, like one word or two words you know you any idea no oh, i i never really knew if it was one or two probably two or two words star wars listen to the music of star wars that was the name of his band it's not whacked out this that was 62 my... once again was just a kid this is incredible and so and then you saw this cat live and he had i mean what was the synth- no I, I i i did a audition for him i did an audition this is really... Cool. He liked me. He, he liked me, too. So I could have done the gig, but then some other things came in, and I took them instead. So so, uh, but, uh, so that cat was doing... in the set, Was he fusing... So he was doing symphonic music with jazz, or what was... How? Yeah, that, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Yeah, he was doing a lot of... Well, not exactly classical. It was just more sounds, just sounds, you know, synthesized sounds, you know, uh, like Pat Metheny does sometimes. You know, it's just big symphonic sounds beautiful beautiful um, pastoral sounds it's fantastic you did, know? did he did he actually but, did he did he ever cut any records did he may ha- did, he, did he no 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 he didn't do anything he, he he's like a mad scientist you know he didn't know what he, was, he didn't know how to get, get his stuff I, I, I mean, he was a, this is this is inc- but i mean so he went for a tra- so maybe one reason you walked away from the the gig was because it was just too insane and <laughs> you didn't think it was really going to go yeah uh, i thought that also i said and he he was a, he was a particularly unpleasant person too so that that didn't help much either you know to be honest with you well wow, this he is was, i really need to get the name of this cat immediately <laughs> I, mean, this, I can't i tell you the truth i don't remember i don't remember i have no remember recollection of his name so i mean don no, something to, that's all i know don bukla bukla it, Bukla. I don't know. Did, did I don't you? Think so. He well, he was the one that first created the first synthesizer, and he was from the West Coast. His name was Don mm-hmm. Bu- Don Bukla. Uh, maybe it was maybe it was him. I don't know. My I, I don't look him up. Yeah, that's probably it. it could but, be. That's uh, here's the thing. Uh, how did you how did you get involved with Barry Miles, and then ultimately was that the first time you were playing odd metered music? Um, no, 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 it wasn't. Um, like I said, I had done some stuff with Don House, but that was later. But, uh, but the, the, I don't, I don't particularly know. That there's a lot of odd metered stuff on that. Re- oh, there's some change of te- change of tempos and stuff. But three, four to four, four. You mean something like that? That's not so odd, really. I mean, that's that's in it's in that's in my wheelhouse with no problem. Yeah. No. So uh, I mean, you know, but, yeah. Did, did you? So here's out of all the out of all the because you played it all. I mean, uh, bossa or you know it was known as samba music. You know uh, before or uh, yeah, it was jazz samba and bossa. then and then obviously uh, when uh, Joe Gilberto came in with that two beat rhythm, it became bossa nova and then and then and then there was you had uh, you know sort of the tail end bebop, <coughs> hard bop, post bop. Um, yeah, could you talk about it? Right, I got you, it. you talk about it. Go ahead. Out of any of those styles, which one was? Could you give an example of one that was challenging for you, and how you overcame the challenge, and how it made you a stronger player? Mm, um, I think the the hardest uh, hardest thing to, that I tried to do in those days was was sort of try to imitate the. These flamenco guitar players, you know, um, 
Sabikis and so on, and uh, of course later it was uh, uh, what's his name? You know that played with Larry, passed away. Um, Jeez, my my brain is I'm losing my no, mind. No, you're here. fine. You're fine. Yeah. You're not talking about like Jose Feliciano uh, or something. No, 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 no. Uh, Sabikis, you know his name, I'm sure. Oh but, my uh, God, Sa- Sabika. I love Sabika. Yeah, sure, Sabika. Yeah, well, I actually, I actually did play with him one time. You I did? played with Sabika, and yeah, I went. I, I got this opportunity to do a recording, and and uh, I w- always wanted to play with him, and so I, um, found, met him over at the, the American Institute of Guitar on Fifty Fifty Fifth Street, was it Fifty Fifty Fifth Fourth Street, something like that. Um, and I played with him, but we couldn't find a common ground. Uh, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't really play his stuff, and he couldn't play mine either. So it was it was a wonderful event to, to talk to him and meet him and play with him. But there was really very little I could do with it because you know, we so di- it was so different styles. But that that was to me was the the major challenge of trying to play something like that. I still try to do it. I can't do it. And and also Julian Bream trying to play classical guitar. That's that that's an impossible task. I think you. I have nothing but high regard for people that can do that. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's very very difficult stuff. It, there's a lot of kind. Of, well, you know, trying to transcribe a Coltrane solo is no is no easy task either. Uh, play some of the lines he played, or even Bill Evans. I mean, anybody. You play Freddie Hubbard solo on the guitar. You're playing something. You're really playing something. But most of my influences in those days were piano players. I was. I was enamored with the piano. I wanted to play Art Tatum, um, uh, Bill Evans, Bud Powell, Oscar Peterson. You know, I wanted to do that. That to me was the ultimate. Because uh, piano was like a real guitar, big guitar. <laughs> why, why did the Why did the Why did the music feel so good? I mean, I was transcribing this interview with Terry Clark, the great drummer from Canada, and he was talking mm-hmm. about. Uh, yeah. He was just. He's talking about rhythm sections. He was talking about Mingus and. And Danny Richmond, but I mean, what was it about yeah. that that Bud Powell, Elmo Hope, Monk kind of? Yeah. What 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 felt so good about it to you? I think it was just that it was so complete. You know, it was just so. It was just. It was. There's nothing. There was nothing limited about it. It wasn't limiting either. You know, you could pretty much play anything you want. Play and you just listen to uh, one Art Tatum solo. You go, holy mackerel! <laughs> how do I comp- <laughs> comprehend that? You know, that's just. Uh, uh, Any time I feel like I'm really doing something wonderful and great on the guitar, all you do is put on an Art Tatum track, and I just sit back and say, "You don't know anything, man." <laughs> <laughs> but strangely enough, some some fans of mine have called me the Art Tatum of the piano of the guitar, <laughs> which I I find extremely flattering. You know, what That's, a beautiful compliment. <laughs> yeah, I always thought that. You know, John Bunch called that, said that to me that I was the Art Tatum of the guitar. <laughs> is is, are we, is John Bunch still with us? No, no. Oh, sorry. What a legendary yeah, character! Sorry. No, I mean, I mean, so much of this yeah. stuff. But I mean, I want to ask you this: this is a point. I mean, because, uh, like, the the thing is, you can transcribe an Elvin Jones solo, or you can trans. Yes. Or, I mean, like you did probably the best cover version of Red Clay, which is a Freddie Hubbard tune. But uh, but the, yeah. the the thing is, this it, you can transcribe that. But it, it, mm. there's something about the. That's what Terry Clark was talking about. Is that when he was listening to the Coltrane records with Elvin, he would slow the records down so that he could figure out what Elvin was doing with his left hand and his and his I think bass drum, and so then he just learned how to play that, and then he incorporated it into his style. I mean, do you think that? Yes. The, do you find that? Do you think that the auto? You guys were autodidacts too. You were able to hear something one time. You didn't have rewind buttons per se. If you heard it on the radio, do you believe that the idea of the auto, the auditory listening, slowing down the record, and then putting it into your own music, is better than just trying to transcribe something and then it turns out to be some something very sterile? You're never gonna, you know, duplicate what Elvin Jones was doing. No, quite right. You can't duplicate it. But you, you, and slowing it down doesn't hurt. It doesn't help. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't do anything. It just it just makes you aware of what the actual note was. Perhaps you know. See, I can't hear that damn note. Right. Let me slow it down. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. It's sort of a B flat. It's not really clear what the note is. But if you try to imitate that, you can't do it. I mean, you can simulate simulate it, but you can't imitate it. And it, why bother imita- imitating it really? Because when you're on the bandstand, you're not going to be able to play that anyway. You you got to be in the moment when you're on the bandstand. You can't be thinking about what Elvin Jones did 30 years ago. 
Hello. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm I'm taking you all in. Yeah. No, I mean, I, 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 I'm trying to get, I mean, here's, here is, I wanted to read you this quote from a, a comrade of yours, a guy that I'm sure you, you might've crossed paths with and then, um, and then get your feedback on it. Uh, yeah. Let's see here. He said, uh, here you go. Uh, this is from Mundell low. He said, uh, oh, Mundell, yeah. uh, the only way, uh, there's really no way of teaching jazz, even though they try to do it in the schools. I admire them for trying. Many of these teachers don't know what they're doing as far as teaching jazz. There's really no way of teaching jazz unless you get a kid in a room, you sit him down and say, you watch what I'm going to do on guitar, and I want you to do what I'm going to do after you see me do it. It's monkey see, monkey do all the way. You need to sit with your instrument hour and after hour after hour after hour, and, there's, and your sound and your approach to music will come into focus. That's the only way you yeah. can do it. You can't say, well, mm-hmm. today I'm going to play like Les Paul, and tomorrow I'm going to play like Tal Farlow. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. Uh, well, hold on a second. I got to. I got to get the other phone because this phone is. is um, uh, hold on. Sure. Hello. Yeah. Okay. There you go. I, I'm going to charge this phone and use the other phone for now. Okay. Uh, yeah. No, I totally agree with that. That's what you just said about the Mundell Lohan. So he's quite right. However, there are other factors involved too. I mean, there. You know, you have to. You have to. It, it's almost like a computer that um, has to be um, fed information, but that information has to be processed and and uh, and digested. You can't just process. You can't just gather information and expect to learn. Information is valid, and important, but it's not the end all. You have to process that information and 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 make it organic. And uh, that's the only way that that what you know is going to help come across. There are nights where I play and, uh, gee, I, wow, I, said, I really stunk tonight. My God, it was awful. And I would go home and I'd say, what did I, what was happening here? And uh, I, I would start practicing some stuff and say, oh, I see. My left hand was just a little bit off the thing and the right hand was uh, was not calm and I was sick to my stomach or what <laughs> you know there's a million factors involved in playing you know and sometimes the worse you feel the better you can play on the bandstand so that's just another dichotomy it doesn't make any sense at all i've experienced that could too, you, could you, could, could you, could you talk about a specific time when you felt miserable and actually burned to the to the heavens yeah sure i was i was uh, i i had a very difficult time uh a couple couple of days time in my life it's a long story i'm not going to get into it but sure. uh it was a, it was a very painful period in my life and um i got on the bandstand with buddy rich and uh i just tore it up you know but so it gave me a, it was like a great great release i mean i let everything loose buddy was so happy he said man what are you are you on drugs or something <laughs> i said no <laughs> no <laughs> i don't do anything buddy nothing at all i don't even drink so he he was uh, he was just kidding me, you know. But he loved oh, he it. Was a, he was a it te- was actually, yeah, he was a teetotaler too. So you know, um, but but I never saw him drink. Yeah, no, I mean, did did uh, I, I you know I noticed that you have a uh, gigs periodically with uh, with Mike Clark, and I wanted you to talk about why you enjoy playing, what his drumming, what his time feel is like, uh, and 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 how you guys lock in, and if you and why you enjoy playing with him. Yeah, Mike. Mike's a special drummer. He um, he and I hooked hooked up as friends right away, so that helped too. But uh, when did you, know, you first did you, when did you first meet him? Uh, I think it was the early '80s, maybe. Right on. Hold on a second. I I have a student that just showed up here, so no, you know what? And, and um, we, we, we we we're we we we're wrapping in five minutes, so just let him let him know. Okay, I'm just on this interview. Can you wait five? John, yeah, he's cool. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so Mike Clark. Yeah, so yeah, so but uh, what I did like about uh, uh, and and still like about his but he br- he brings another dynamic to the uh, to the drums and the, the, the time feel, which is very he hits it in odd places too. Something like something like what I was talking about before. Um, he's not he knows where it is in terms of the uh, beat, but sometimes he turns it around on purpose just to make it fun. And I love that. And he brings a it's a nice nice thing he brings to the party. Um can to the you, music. Do you did 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 uh did you ever run into Freddie Hubbard? Did Freddie ever hear your cover of his Red Clay? No. No, I wish I had. I never met him. Never met him. No. I've seen him play, but I never met him. 
That's, I would love to play with him. In the, you know, I, I'd, li- I'd like to do a part two with you, but I wanted to just, in our in our remaining moments here, if, if you could just talk uh, in general about uh, if you were heavily influenced by uh, Freddie Green from the Basie Band, because for a long time the rhythms, the drummer from that, from his group, uh, was taking his cues from Freddie Green. And, oh, interesting. And yeah. uh, and I and I just wanted you to. I mean, again, I, I'm fixated. We, my daughters and younger generations, they've had digital beats crushed into their ears. They really can't uh, hear space in the music. They they don't know how the music breathes. And I just, I'd like you to talk a little bit about how music, how in your the the Jack Wilkins concept of letting the music breathe. Yeah, well, you know, like I said, when I was a youngster, I did a lot of gigs with ba- big bands. And Don Ellis was one of them, but I also played with Larry Elkhart's orchestra, Warren Covington, Sammy Kay, uh, Richard Maupey, all these old bands, and most of it was dance-like music. But believe me, you learn a lot of stuff from that, and you'd be surprised how many great players were in that band. Michael Brecker, Randy Brecker, um, uh, Lou Lou Tobacken, um, wonderful players, so... You met a lot of great musicians, and that's what a lot of gigs were about in those days. If there wasn't any live gig to play jazz, you did bad dance bands, and it was a living. It's okay. I didn't exactly learn from uh, uh, Freddie Green, but I certainly was influenced by that kind of music in terms of playing four to the bar. Actually, a friend of mine showed me more of that than anyone else. His name was Dan Armstrong. Wow. Maybe you know his name. No, I don't. Uh, that's yeah, unbelievable. No. Well, listen, you go to your lesson. His son, his son yeah. was named, was Kent, is Kent Armstrong, the one who makes the guitar pickups. Um, the, the, yeah, I was going to say Dan, that. Dan, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, I just, I, I found, one of the reasons I reached out to you a couple of weeks ago, finally, is because I uh, was, was scrolling through the miscellaneous rock, the D section of the rock music in uh, the record store, and, uh, Dawn of a of a day, uh, Albert. Daly. Oh, Albert Daly. And yeah. dude, you're playing, and that's what I want to do in part two with you is to play you some of these clips because I don't know if you have a copy of that record, but that yeah, I do. That you're playing on that was amazing. I mean, incredibly, Thanks. incredibly cool. So, um, I, you know, I had a ball talking to you, Jack, and, uh, and oh, me too, me I, too. I'll, uh, if you want to call again tomorrow or the next day, we can finish it off. No, we'll we'll we'll, we'll set up a time. To, I'll, I'll call you later. We'll set up a time to to do it so I can we, I can get in the studio. Okay, terrific. Right. Have a great have a great thank you. Have I enjoyed. Yeah, have a great day, Jack. Thanks you too. I appreciate it. It's fun. All right, buddy. Bye bye. Bye. That was Jack Wilkins. We've already had a pretty entertaining morning here. Uh, and uh, we will uh, be back with uh, Bertha Hope Hope in just a minute.
Thank <laughs> you.